name is Dr Christine Hosking. I work at the University of Queensland in the Global Change Institute and my research interests are around the impacts of climate change um, on wildlife and ecosystems uh, and food security. So my research into koalas started um, several years ago when I was interested in whether climate change might be affecting koalas. Uh, particularly into the future under future climate change projections. So koalas have been in Australia for at least 30 million years according to the fossil records. So for my PhD research I felt it was important to understand the past before starting to look to the future under climate change. Australia has had many different climates over over you know the millennia um, and the fossil records were fascinating. We've had many different species and genera of koala um, and they've been very widely distributed. They've been living throughout Central Australia at Lake Eyre, which is now desert, Western Australia, um, all sorts of areas, far north Queensland, areas where they no longer occur. So this little guy is actually the last member of a once far more diverse family tree. So this species, Phascolarctus sanarius, is actually the only last living um, species of koala. So it's terribly important that we preserve them because once this species of koala is gone, they're all gone forever. So, um, and then I did some modelling initially at the last glacial maximum about 18,000 years ago to discover, I wonder where koalas might have been under a different climatic situation and then it was much colder and much drier. And uh, I found that koalas would have contracted to a very small area in southeast Queensland, northern New South Wales, that would have been certainly their core range. Um, and then of course about 15 million years ago when Australia started to dry out uh, and eucalypt trees that they now eat became more predominant through the landscape, they expanded outwards in their range again. Um, so that was sort of the background for my research. I thought a bit like climate change modelling, you need to understand the past to really understand the future properly. So that was the first thing I did and then from there I developed uh, climate projections for the range of koalas now and what future climate predictions uh, might mean to where they can occur. And I also modelled their food trees. I chose five of their favourite food trees from throughout the current range of the koala, uh, which is Queensland, New South Wales, um, Australian Capital Territory, Victoria and South Australia. So I um, developed models for some of their key food tree species and had a look at where climate change might also affect the distribution of their food resources as well as the koalas themselves. Koalas um, now, uh, unlike in, in those past uh, millennia when, uh, when Australia was actually uh, a much better vegetated, warmer and wetter climate, um, and in central Australia, Lake Eyre used to be covered in forest and there are many uh, koala fossils in there, for instance, in central Australia, but of course it dried out. So now, Koalas tend to um, occur mostly along the Eastern Australian coastline. They have always occurred in um, uh, uh, inland as well, but this is where climate change impacts are really, uh, according to my modelling, are really going to be felt. Um, so what's happening is the koalas range is contracting from the inland, more arid western zones, particularly in Queensland and New South Wales, eastwards. And this is where we have a real problem with the where east meets west because of course the eastern coastline is where most Australians live and where the development and ur urbanisation is occurring. So there's a combination of threats now um, acting synergistically on koalas. Climate change is very much pushing koalas um, eastwards towards urbanising centres. Um, so what we're getting almost is um, a real impact from uh, increased weather extremes to the west of their range. So long, long periods of drought and heat wave um, and the koala just can't thermoregulate um, adequately, but the trees are also being affected by those droughts and heat waves. So um, the trees are drying out, so the koala is not getting the nutrition and the moisture through the leaf content, because of course that's what they're completely dependent on. Um, they have a very limited diet. Um, and then of course, um, so their food resource is getting affected as well. Um, but their climate envelope that I've modelled suggests that anything over about 37 degrees um, is, uh, stresses them and of course now in Australia we're experiencing a week of days in the 40s. So those prolonged extremes in climate are really affecting the koala. In the 80s um, a 60% decline after a heat wave was documented in the mulga lands of Queensland um, and then more recently um, there's been another 80% decline in the western regions. Uh, that's over a 10-year period during a 10-year drought. 
Uh, so um, my predictions of these contractions are actually being validated by underground observations now. 80% is catastrophic. It's completely catastrophic. And then in the urban strip, we're experiencing similar declines of 60-70% uh, from other impacts on the eastern edge. Uh, and this is from dog attacks um, and car hits and just that loss and fragmentation of their habitat, roads, rails, um, and then predation. Uh, so the koala is really getting hit from all directions now. So in heatwaves and droughts, um, the adaptation measures for koalas are not great. They're not a very mobile species. So for instance, if their climate envelope has shifted 300 kilometres eastwards, a koala can't just think, I'll just hop over 300 kilometres. They're not that mobile. Um, a male may travel up to 20 kilometres maximum if he's leaving his home range and leaving his mother and wants to create his own territory. Um, uh, but a, a female koala, if she has adequate ad habitat, will often only move four or five kilometres, even smaller home range, if the conditions are favourable for her. So to expect a koala to move hundreds of kilometres under such rapid climate change as we're experiencing now is impossible. So this is why we're getting real population crashes in those areas. Um, adaptation measures, some ad adaptation measures that they do is they'll find trees that are more shady. Um, so sometimes a non-food tree, but if it's got a good canopy of shade, they'll tend to go higher in the tree and seek shade. Um, but nonetheless, um, that's only, they have their limitations. So this thermoregulation will kick in and eventually they will just fall from the tree and not be able to cope and die of heat, stress and dehydration. Um, another adaptation measure, um, well, they already adapt in a way by sleeping a lot through the day to try and stay cool and become more active at night. But um, that's about it. Under different emissions scenarios, um, I, I did most of my modelling on the business as usual scenario because as we are now aware, that is actually where we are tracking. So the business as usual is uh, high reliance on fossil fuels, high population growth and uh, everything high energy from fossil fuel requirements from people. So um, I based most of my modelling on the worst case scenario because that is where we're now tracking, as simple as that. Um, so those sort of drastic, and, and as I said, where research is being done, those, those um, pessimistic scenarios appear to be eventuating with these population declines of 80 plus percent of koalas in the western edges of that range, where the heat waves and droughts are particularly bad. Um, under a lesser, under the, if you wanted to um, go backwards to a, a kinder scenario, say if by 2050 we have managed to stay, you know, um, below two, two degrees of warming, for instance, which appears unlikely at the moment. If we did, well, for a start, how many koalas will be left by 2050? Um, that's a big question. Um, so, but the kinder, the, the sort of less extreme scenarios, um, those effects would just be less pronounced. So perhaps there'd be a little more in the western areas of their range, particularly um, habitat that might stay viable for koalas. Um, but the, the food trees I modelled are also going to be affected similarly. So even if the koala manages to hang in in some of these areas where it's going to be hotter and drier, um, the question is, will their food trees still be there as well? So um, that's where the modelling work I did will hopefully help influence conservation planning decisions. So um, you know, if, um, if land managers want to look at an area, for instance, under the Carbon Farming Initiative that the Australian Government is um, very actively pursuing at the moment, um, looking at areas to rehabilitate. So perhaps looking at areas that potentially um, could be set aside for carbon sequestration, it would be nice to plant it for koalas, uh, plant it out with their food trees. But the modelling can help guide them on which food trees are likely to be viable in those areas that they're looking at. My projections into the future go from the current climate to 2030 and then 2050 and then 2070. So they're going out as far as 2070. And uh, the mapping indicates uh, very clearly these contractions eastwards that you can see. If we look at the southern states where the koala is not federally listed as vulnerable at the moment, um, uh, because there appear to be abundant koalas in those states for all sorts of other reasons, um, historical reasons in terms of koalas being um, culled for the fur trade back in the early 1900s. Um, so some koalas were put on islands down in Victoria and South Australia um, because they were literally being um, shot in the hundreds of thousands and they'd become virtually extinct on the mainland in the southern states. So some koalas were put on islands um, but they have bred in big numbers because the islands did have suitable habitat. So it became unsustainable for them to stay on the islands. They've um, 
eaten themselves out of house and home. So they're now being translocated back to the mainland, but that is fraught with problems because in, on the mainland, particularly in the southern states of Australia, um, again, the same problems are there. Habitat loss, fragmentation, wildfires, bushfires, which are catastrophic for koalas. And in fact, one area a few years ago in Victoria, um, it was sort of an isolated bushland um, national park called Framlingham, and it had several hundred koalas living on it that had been translocated back from islands. Um, it was good habitat, they were doing well. And then um, a bushfire came through and took them all out. And of course, they had nowhere to disperse to because it was an island on a mainland ocean of urbanisation and farmland. So, um, so it's uh, even down south, although the federal government has not yet recognised that they are in deep trouble there as well, um, there are the same, many of the same threats. Climate change is also impacting um, down in the southern states of Australia very much with the increased bushfires, increased heat waves. Yeah. My predictions don't um, specifically address bushfire risk, but when you have the prolonged droughts and heat waves, um, one consequence will be bushfires. And in fact, um, the Black Saturday bushfires in Victoria several years ago um, were a very good example of that where Victoria experienced, I think, five or six days over 45 degrees. And during that time, um, on the internet, people were posting what they thought were bizarre sightings of koalas, wild koalas they didn't even know occurred in their area, were coming in and taking water out of the dog's drinking bowl, licking hunger, uh, thirstily out of a tap, out of a garden tap. And people were put, and other koalas, literally lying beside a swimming pool, nearly dead, just trying to get to moisture. Uh, and it was sort of a, pretty spooky because a few days after all those photographs went up on the internet um, it was almost if we listened to the koalas we might have seen what was happening because then the bushfires broke out several days after that. Um, so that was a classic example of the koalas showing us hey these weather conditions are so extreme and so catastrophic we're all dying and bang Black Saturday fires happened and of course many many koalas and other wildlife that Australian native wildlife that lives in the same habitat as koalas were completely destroyed in those fires. So at the moment, the future for koalas looks pretty grim. Um, this fellow's mother was killed by a dog. Um, we have to address um, controlling uh, dogs in areas where, in urban areas where koalas are still occurring. Um, we need to obviously mitigate um, our CO2 emissions um, and bring climate change under control. Um, and that's for many species, of course, not just koalas. It's very difficult because in the eastern areas of Australia with so much urban development, so many people living here, it's very hard to know how an animal like this can possibly cohabitate with roads and cars and people and just loss of these leaves. And he, he's very fussy. He, he's evolved to be a real specialist on certain species of this leaf, this obviously being one of them. And uh, when these trees go, he, he, has no other, he has no way to adapt to that. Um, he'll get down off the tree, he'll try and move and then get skittled maybe by a car or taken by a dog. So the urban dilemma is, is a real issue. Uh, the western dilemma at the moment due to climate change is a real issue. My personal recommendations are to be um, proactively setting aside corridors, large corridors for koalas. Uh, and of course they need large areas of continual habitat, at least 100 hectares. Uh, and the more the better that connect. Uh, without roads and urbanisation being in the way. And Australia is lucky if we move a little inland. So if we look at there's a Great Dividing Range and some areas of hinterland um, and hills that are lush and attract rainfall and are cooler, that are often uh, just to the west of the coastal strip. And a lot of these areas are still very viable for koala and other wildlife conservation. And I would love to see decision makers um, setting those aside and proactively conserving them for um, koalas, wildlife and of course the ecosystem services, all those things that keeping those ecosystems provide to human beings as well. Mm. So the story of this particular koala here, um, he is uh, with a wildlife carer. Wildlife carers uh, look after native animals that have been orphaned, uh, usually due to their mothers being killed by a car or a dog. Um, and they come into care from a very young age and simply would not survive on their own. We don't know how many of them, of course, never get to carers. Um, and of course, they just die where they are. Um, but guys like this one were lucky and got found because the mother was being radio tracked um, bef uh, because she was living in an area which is uh, being urbanized and developed. So the koalas in there are being monitored 
um, to see the impacts of this new development on them. Um, so they found the mother and uh, she had been dead for about 24 hours. So there are some wonderful koala carers and other wildlife carers around Queensland and around Australia who take these animals in um, for uh, basically they give their time and uh, the expenses are out of their own pocket and they dedicate themselves to the job of bringing these animals up to a stage uh, where they can be released hopefully into a, a good area of a habitat. So they're being given a second chance at life basically. So this koala is only a year old, it's got quite a bit of maturing to do yet um, and uh, he will be released hopefully um, into some good habitat and there are many koalas and other native animals in the hands of carers and uh, I don't know how any of these animals would go without these wonderful wildlife carers. There are some carers who band together and develop a group and have a website um, and they of course will always welcome donations uh, but there is no formal structure set up for instance by the government to help them. Um, the, uh, the, government, the local government in Queensland has recently released a, a round of funding applications specifically targeting wildlife carers so they can go to all the effort of applying for the money. Um, it's a bit of a shame that they have to do all that though with their time being so stretched many sleepless light nights especially when this little one was younger and getting up in the night to feed him as well. Um, but at the moment that's really all they get is uh, they can occasionally apply for some funding from a, an official source and uh, get some money to help supplement what they do. Uh, during the Black Saturday fires there was a lot of publicity surrounding the plight of the native wildlife and um, some people including myself managed to get the word and that's really through the social networks um, and the word got out that the carers were in desperate need because so many burnt and charred and injured animals were coming into care and the carers couldn't cope so um, people were donating their old sheets and blankets and towels um, and some cash um, but generally it's not a very formal structure. Mm. The main challenges for koala carers um, uh, are burnout, it's very tiring and it's pretty thankless and it never ends, sadly it never ends, the steady stream of koalas like this one coming into care. In fact, um, we get a bit concerned when we'll see a certain geographic area where suddenly the koalas aren't coming into the wildlife hospitals and then being passed on to carers and that's pretty much usually a sign that the koalas are all gone from that area. So you tend to get a peak of incidents from an area that might be suddenly being developed a lot um, uh, or out west it could be a, a mine for instance has been built and so suddenly what used to be a country road is taking very large volumes of mining traffic. So we also have cases of where koala populations have uh, declined drastically from traffic, increased traffic on a road that used to be fairly quiet. So um, it can happen for different reasons away from the coast as well. Um, but uh, sleepless nights, carers uh, have to put up with a lot of ongoing fatigue. Um, they're pretty much fatigued all the time. So it really is for the love of it and knowing that you're giving these animals a second chance. The carers often need caring and uh, they often need a holiday and I don't think they take them very often. Carer groups tend to be quite loosely aggregated um, uh, and quite broadly dispersed around the place. Um, some of the larger carer groups have formed websites. Um, someone can go on their website um, and uh, express interest in becoming a carer. They then have to go through a training process which is only a couple of workshops um, because you can't just think I love that cute furry thing I want to look after it. In fact ignorance can be very dangerous. So um, they must be trained and taught about how to care for these animals properly uh, and that, that can be organised through some of the larger carer organisations. It would be lovely to have more volunteers as wildlife carers um, uh, because there is a turnover because they do get exhausted or perhaps they'll have a family of their own or for, they may move um, for whatever reason so we always always need more wildlife carers and um, there can never be enough wildlife carers it would be wonderful to see more people perhaps who love animals and at the moment put a lot of energy into domestic pets for instance um, it would be lovely if they express that love through native wildlife that's been here for millions of years and often like the koala occurs nowhere else on the planet One of the reasons why koalas are so fussy with leaf is because eucalyptus leaf has uh, large amounts of toxins. Um, it's not at all palatable. So a koala needs to seek out a tree that does have some nutrients such as nitrogen as well as the toxins. Uh, and the reason they are so sleepy is because it takes pretty much all their energy to simply digest all the toxins in this leaf. They tend to have trees that are their very favourites, what I call their Swiss chocolate species. 
uh, and these vary regionally. So down in Victoria, um, it will be a different favourite chocolate to uh, a tree further in up north in New South Wales or in Queensland. In Queensland, um, in the more western areas, it might be river red gum, Eucalyptus camelgulensis, which uh, they um, really favour. Uh, and that tree grows along watercourses and uh, in drainage lines, so uh, it puts down deep roots. And of course, this is why that tree is also being impacted by climate change, the rivers dry up and so on. Uh, if we come out to the coast, it's, um, uh, there are trees such as tallow woods, um, Eucalyptus microcorius in the Queensland area that they um, seems to be their very favourite, uh, and um, forest red gum. Uh, if we move further south into Victoria, managum um, uh, is a very popular tree. Uh, and so they're some of the species that I did model to see how those trees would be also impacted by climate change. Uh, and the results varied according to the tree species, but a lot of the trees also do contract a lot eastwards, uh, back to those urban areas again. Often you'll see a koala at the bottom of a tree and he'll be sniffing and uh, it's actually deciding whether that leaf might be good leaf. Um, and a lot of the nutrients and toxin balance comes of course from rainfall, moisture and also from the soil. So soil is a really important thing. And that is one of the other issues that um, we tend to farm and develop areas that are on really good soil. So that good soil happens to also be where the best food trees for the koalas are. So they've also lost out there. So now they're often forced into secondary, what we call secondary habitat. So it's not perfect trees. Um, uh, the carer has sourced these, this leaf from specially grown trees for koalas. Um, so this is why he's loving it so much. Um, but in general, um, a koala, you know, you might see six trees in a very small area and you might think, why are all the koalas just in that one tree? And it's because that is the best tree in terms of that balance of nutrients and toxins. So, um, and this is why it's a problem if they're in an in a island situation, whether it's an ocean island or a mainland island, why it's difficult because they'll all be gravitating to their best Swiss chocolate trees and they will um, ignore other trees. So they will defoliate, they will just literally overbrowse certain trees that are the best ones for them. So in the old days, of course, before humans came along to Australia a couple of hundred years ago, you know, there was continuous habitat and a koala could meander around, find the best trees. The soil hadn't been degraded. Um, the, the best soils in the best areas with the best trees were available for them. So even as I mentioned with the um, modelling at the last glacial maximum, even though the koala's range probably did contract, of course when the weather conditions improved, the koala was able to simply expand his range again because we weren't in the way and that's what's changed now. So I've done some modelling on the potential effects of uh, future climate change on agriculture using uh, several uh, case study commodities in Australia, in Eastern Australia. Um, so looking at grazing, which is very widespread throughout the whole country, and cropping and avocado production. And I um, ran models um, projecting to 2035 based on a lot of interviews with um, farmers and industry um, to look at an extension officers, so people, experts in the field, to um, determine what would be the best climatic and other environmental variables to put into my models. So to make it meaningful, so you know, an, um, avocados prefer uh, certain climatic factors very important for avocado growing at certain times, so you need to know what they are. So um, after doing that uh, and getting feedback saying they didn't really want to know about 2080, they'd prefer to know more in their foreseeable future, it was a bit more tangible for them. Um, I modelled these three commodities both under the current climate at 2025 and 2035. And um, the impacts are pretty profound. Um, at this time I used um, two different global climate models. So one was um, a pessimistic business as usual model um, under that sort of scenario, but um, you know, predicting a hotter, drier future. Um, the other model uh, pr is predicted a warmer, still not, still hotter and drier, but not as extreme. Um, so a bit warmer and wetter than the extreme, because I thought for, for this industry, it was important to show them a couple of options. 
not just the real doomsday one. And farmers are brilliant at climate change adaptation already, I learned. Um, they have been doing adaptation measures for years, improving their technology, growing different types of crops, even buying multiple properties so, to, so that if it's dry in one area, their farm 50 kilometres away might have had rain. So they cover their base, all sorts of adaptation strategies they've been doing for many years. So you have to be very sensitive to that when you talk to them, I'm not come in and say, I've sat behind a computer, and run, a computer and run models and I can tell you. So with this range of scenarios and, and outcomes, um, uh, it still does appear under both um, climate models that I used um, that these three commodities will certainly be affected by climate change. Um, and that varies very much regionally though, um, because particularly for rainfall, the rainfall predictions are less reliable than the temperature predictions, and they're very much more uh, regionally spaced. So um, whereas overall we know it's going to be warmer, uh, we don't know so much about rain. Some areas will be much drier, some areas will get monsoonal rain still and they'll be okay. So this all went into the model and as a result there was a lot of spatial variation in the predictions but overall I found a significant decline in all those three commodities under future climate change. Um, so hopefully this work will be a bit of a decision support tool for them so that they can look at perhaps okay this area, this northwestern part of our our agricultural cropping zone, for instance, in northern Queensland, is definitely going to be seriously affected by climate change. Um, but we can at least still focus our cropping in other regions which appear to be okay, uh, even under future climate change. So it again was just helping with decision support. Uh, these models aren't silver bullets, but overall the message was definitely um, substantial impacts from climate change. So un under business as usual, avocado, for instance, will decline by 80 eight percent between now and at 2035 so it will become much more contracted uh, on little coastal pockets um, than it is now um, down in Victoria there's an area called Sunraysia where it, it according to the models, both models, it'll pretty much disappear from there, which is a bit inland in Victoria, and it'll really shrink down to the coast. Um, cropping um, will, uh, by tw between now and 20, 2035, will decline by, I don't have the figures, uh, it's in excess of 50% uh, under the pessimistic scenario, and about 25% under even the, the kinder global climate model. Um, and grazing, Grazing will be not quite so impacted because um, it's so widely, the models almost weren't as reliable for grazing because grazing is so widely, it's all over Australia. Um, so it's a little bit harder for the model to tease things out of that. Um, but grazing will definitely shift and it'll contract in some areas. Some areas will improve um, where there is still rainfall predicted to occur. Um, so it's just, a bit, it's all going to shift and in many places it's going to contract dramatically. The interesting thing about going out and talking to farmers rather than just doing the modelling was to find out that they're already doing these adaptation measures. So, and one example for instance is tomatoes used to grow in the Lockyer Valley um, west of Brisbane and they have disappeared. The farmers aren't growing tomatoes there at all, they've moved down to the granite belt where it's cooler and wetter and that, that meant that's already happened in real time without us even knowing, um, well without the average person knowing. So. Um, yeah, it's going to have a big effect on farmers um, and many of them are already and a lot of them are already mixing their types of cropping um, and having a plan B crop because they're learning that plan A crop is actually failing now. There is an argument with farming and cropping for instance that um, increasing CO2 helps growth, plant growth, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated than that and although some crops will benefit from that, it may be offset for instance by the fact that there's drought and no rain. So it's a, it's a, it's a balance. Um, so, uh, and flooding, extreme weather events may well um, neutralise those benefits of increased CO2. Uh, models are only models and they're not silver bullets. So they're not building in a lot of these subtle things like human adaptation, um, improvement in technology um, and extreme events and so on. But what we do know from the climate models is that these extreme events are going to happen more often and they are really already impacting all sorts of farming in Australia in a very big way.
I got into this area of research originally um, because I was actually talking to um, a person who runs a koala conservation organisation and I met her socially and we got talking and she said I would love to fund some research. Um, if you're thinking of doing a PhD, I'd love to talk to you about funding. So uh, it hadn't necessarily been about koalas in the beginning. Um, there was going to be something to do with ecology and wildlife, but uh, I happened to meet this person and she heads a, a large koala organi conservation organisation, so that's what steered me that way. What's interesting me the most in terms of, in my area of interest, would have to be the impacts of um, human encroachment onto native ecosystems and the bigger, the bigger effect of what that means for ecosystem services um, that underpin our quality of life as humans. So I suppose it, it interests me that um, to find out more about what we can do in the face of population growth, climate change, um, and increase an increasingly populated world. Uh, how can we manage to balance feeding the world and accommodating humans while still holding on to our precious ecosystems that are really fundamental to everything. I think these days um, scientists are getting a lot better about communicating their science to the general public. Um, social media helps a lot, publications like The Conversation that are freely available to everyone online and they're written by scientists but in everyday language. I think. Um, more and more scientists are understanding that they've got to use those sorts of avenues now to reach the general public. Um, and I think scientists have to continue to talk with policy makers and government, um, even if at times that's hard, um, to keep pushing and trying to open those doors. Um, with koalas, I've certainly had a lot of success communicating with um, government over the plight of the koala, um, and it's been successful, so it's encouraging. And I think um, scientists just need to realise they have to talk in general language sometimes to communicate their messages. People who don't accept the science of climate change are very challenging and um, require a lot of diplomacy. And I think most people who, like me, who've tried to um, convince um, people who don't believe in climate change really um, don't get very far. And my feeling is that it's almost more a case of some sort of positive reinforcement, so to approach it differently rather than lecture um, people, which really does alienate you almost instantly, um, is to just talk about things around climate change, like, um, you know, you live on the river and what a beautiful spot and uh, it'd be nice to, to keep that water flowing or um, wouldn't it be sad if we lose our koalas because of these wretched droughts? Um, so a more indir indirect approach can engage people rather than just saying, I'm telling you this is how it is, because that fails. I have seen arguments sometimes where um, critics have not wanted to um, acknowledge the science but have tried to say you're just making that all up because you want funding for your next round of research. But um, it, certainly in my experience it's never about that, it's about the love of what you're doing and the real, your own inner values and beliefs that make you want to work on something because you feel really passionate about informing the broader population about this problem or trying to solve a problem that you know really is important and meaningful. And I think um, the funding is secondary. And sometimes, of course, your institution will need funding to help support you to do that because research costs money and that's fine, but I don't think it's a driving force. I think it's all about answering really important questions that to you are meaningful, and that's always the first priority. Humans are causing a rapid escalation in climate change um, through greenhouse gas emissions and through burning fossil fuels and uh, we need our decision makers at the big end of town, um, a bit like Obama and the Chinese leader recently did, to really um, grab it and take real action.
It's like the Cirque du Soleil behind you at the moment. Is it? <laughs> 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 this was the whole point of not having the koalas in it. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're doing it out of shot anyway, aren't they? It's kind of <laughs>